Well, I'm a traditional therapist. Uh, initially, I worked not in past life regression or in any of the things that I do today. Primarily, I was um, working in behavior modification and uh, working with people who uh, had problems with uh, sleeping and with depression, this sort of thing. Uh, in time, people would come to me and ask, well, since you are working in hypnosis, is it possible that you could take me into a past life? And I was very imperious in those days. I said, no, I don't do those kinds of things. I'm terribly sorry, but I'm very traditional in my academic orientation, and uh, um, you would have to go to somebody else for that kind of thing. So what happened to me was that after a number of years passed, I had a client who came complaining of a pain in his side. Um, he told me that he'd been to many medical doctors, had x-rays, and was told that it was all psychosomatic. It was in his mind and that if he just forgot about it, it would go away. But it was causing him intense pain. He wasn't sleeping well and so forth. He asked me if I could possibly find any root causes for this in his childhood, if I could regress him to his childhood. So I did this and we searched and I looked through uh, many of the early aspects of his childhood and I could find him not falling on a sharp object or being involved with knives in any way or anything that would cause this very sharp pain in his side. So finally in frustration I said to this individual who by the way went very deep very quickly in hypnosis which is an important part of what I'm saying because that to me is a key in reaching into the uh, past life work that I now do and, and, and my interlife work. I said, go to the source of your pain. Tell me the first time it happened. And suddenly he was on the battlefields of France in World War I in a British division at the Battle of so the Somme and was being bayoneted. So while the poor fellow had suddenly regressed into a past life almost getting ahead of me and he's lying in the mud dying, I'm so skeptical because that's my nature that I'm asking him to describe his division patch for me on his arm. What battle is this, I asked. Where are we? Who are you fighting? Because I'm not satisfied that this is really happening to me. So uh, he described all these things very accurately and since I, I am an amateur historian, I knew he was accurate. And so I realized that I'd had my first past life case and I uh, worked in desensitizing him just as I would have done if he'd have been a six-year-old child who'd speared himself in the kitchen, for instance, while his mother wasn't there. So from that case, I realized that um, that past life regression was very real. I was still somewhat skeptical. I did a lot more experimenting, of course, and working with people, and a lot more time passed. And then what happened to me was another case, almost by accident. A lady came to me who complained of loneliness and isolation in society and she felt that she was not really a part of this world that she just felt so disoriented with the life that she was living and the people that were around her she was thinking of suicide and so again I worked with this lady as I had done with this man but not in past life work um, we, we talked about a lot of childhood issues. I put her in hypnosis. We worked a lot with uh, her early life and so forth and uh, really didn't come up with anything. So like with the man I just spoke about, I asked this lady, go to the source of your loneliness and lack of companionship. And again, she was very somnambulistic. She went very deep very quickly. Uh, she was a very good hypnosis subject. And she said, I see them all right now, my companions, they're here in front of me. And I thought, you know, what are we talking about here? Are these, is this a bridge group? Who, who are these people? And she's staring at my office wall with a glazed look and, and she sort of, her eyes are fluttering. And she's saying to me, uh, no, 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 these are my spiritual soulmates. And there are eight of them and she described who they are. And I couldn't believe this. There were just chills went up and down my spine that I had actually, I was talking to someone who was talking about a life between lives. And this is an area of which I had no experience and I'd read no books on. There weren't many books even touching on the subject. So from that case, I began to really research the area between lives. And I soon, as my practice, as time went on, my practice, I changed it to working basically with people who want to know about their immortality.
people who now come to me who are interested in finding out who they really are, who their soulmates are, what their spirit group is like, why they are here on earth, and so forth. To me, these are the profound questions in life. And the psychological benefits that come from people knowing these, these points, these issues in their life, empower them in a way that they uh, had not had before. And so that's essentially how I came to work in the area that I do today. You've got two types of people, those that understand hypnosis and the power of hypnosis and realize that it's, uh, it's for real. The AMA, I might add, has accepted hypnosis uh, as a medical tool since 1958, which is rather late, considering how long it's been around. But the point I want to make is that people do not hallucinate in hypnosis. The conscious mind is not unconscious. It's very aware of what is going on around at all times around the subject. Um, it is not as if you were in bed asleep at night in a deep delta state. You are in what we call uh, an alpha or theta state. So your conscious mind is able to work and help with information that we're deriving from your subconscious. And so Hypnosis, really, in terms of whether you want to believe in hypnosis or not, depends on your willingness to accept self-reports as data. And essentially, it's not like physics, where we have formulas. Uh, in terms of scientific proof, one could argue that's not possible. All I can tell you is that I was a skeptic at first about the whole process of past life regression and working in the life between lives. And what convinced me that it was real and that the, my patients were telling me everything that had actually happened to them in the past was their consistency of their reports. It didn't matter whether someone came to me who was deeply religious or an atheist or any philosophical persuasion in between. Once I had them in deep hypnosis, they all told me the same thing about the spirit world and about their life between lives. At the moment of death, you rise above your body and you look back at it. Now, there have been a lot of near-death experience reports. There have been books written about near-death experiences, and certainly people who have gone through this have appeared on television and, and radio and have described to the public in many forums uh, how they felt and what they experienced. But you have to keep in mind that in a near-death experience, we're talking about someone who is clinically dead only for a few minutes, so they wouldn't be around to tell what they experienced. In my case, I have a client in, in hypnosis for some three hours questioning him about these things. They're also in a relaxed state. They're not undergoing any body trauma. So they're able to tell me uh, in a very clear and forthright way everything that happened to them. Now, let me explain that there are two types of souls. There are the more advanced type and there are the, the beginner type souls. There are really a few more types, but I'll just talk about these, essentially. Um, the beginner soul, that is, the person who has not lived all that many lives, sometimes have, has difficulty separating from their body. And not that they're not released at the moment of death, but they hang around. They want to go to their funerals, and we're so vain. You know, these people will describe how... Um, they want to find out who's coming to their funeral, who's bringing flowers, um, how much respect is their body being shown, you know, uh, being cremated or putting into the, being put into the ground or what have you. So you have that type of soul who's not really ready to leave Earth's astral plane immediately because they're a little disoriented and also they're kind of reluctant to leave this life in which they've, you know, had so much enjoyment. Then you have the second major type, which are those souls who have been around a long time and they're very experienced. They usually leave very quickly. And so both types, when they look back at their bodies, I want, I want to tell you that there is something that's uppermost on their mind and that is to comfort the loved ones that are left behind. All souls will try to reach out and comfort those who are mourning their deaths. They will try to reach into their minds and, and soothe them in various ways and give them through thought, powerful thought messages, the understanding that they're still alive. Sometimes it's hard because, of course, when we're undergoing this kind of grief, 
you can imagine that we're so overcome with grief that we might shut down in terms of these messages. So these souls might not be able to reach their loved ones for perhaps uh, days or weeks or months later. But that is the intent, to make them feel comfortable. Then, as they pull away, souls describe bright lights and tunnels, the same as the folks that tell us who have had near-death experiences that they have seen. Now, let me explain something I think is really important. We've heard a lot about people seeing religious figures who have undergone near-death experience. I find no case in all of the cases that I've had over all of the years that I've been working with people through their death experiences who have ever seen a religious figure. What they see are their spiritual guides. These are those loving beings who are their teachers who come to them at the moment of death to guide them into the spirit world. Now, I'd like to also say that you may also see people who have, you have known in this life who have passed on ahead of you who will also come and welcome you back. And this too is a very wonderful experience. For instance, people will see their mothers, for example, or a best friend who may have died in front of them, or a brother or sister, this sort of thing. And it's a very ennobling and beautiful experience for them. When a person who has just died sees their spirit guide or friends and relatives who have, they've known before or soulmates, they usually see a projection of a face that is familiar to them. Um, they may take the face of people that they have been in the life that is familiar to the person who has just died or a face that they particularly like that that person who has just died knows how to identify them from. And so you have a number of different faces. People will describe them as looking like ghosts as they come towards us. And maybe this is where some of our mythology about ghosts comes from. Oftentimes they don't see anything below the waist. Essentially they see a light form coming, misty if you will. Um, a pinpoint of light in the beginning and then a misty shape, a ghost-like shape. And then when they get close they can make out you know, features that are projected to them by the being that is coming towards them for recognition. No one that I have ever put in hypnosis has ever seen any demonic figures or hell of any kind. Um, we have heard this from some people who have had near-death experiences, not many, a few. My feeling of that is that those folks who claim that they were they, they could hear screaming, uh, demons dragging them before a, a tribunal of some kind for a judgment and so forth and all these things that are, are very religious in overtones in terms of uh, fostering fear are simply not in the minds of my clients. When someone with a near-death experience says that they thought that's what they experienced, my feeling is that their conscious mind is coming into this in terms of preconditioning because remember these people are not in hypnosis they've just been hit by a car or they're on an operating table bleeding to death uh, there's all sorts of things going on in their physical bodies in the case of trauma and so what has happened here in my view is that their conscious mind is on overload and all of those fears and anxieties that they have had in their walking around state about life after death is coming back to haunt them they are not describing what really exists uh, in terms of, of being taken in front of demons and being punished and so forth. Their bright lights and tunnels are real, but when they start getting into a lot of the things that concern them in terms of their conscious fears, I suspect preconditioning. My clients tell me that the spirit world is a place of love, forgiveness, and kindness. That regardless of what they have done on earth in terms of wrongdoing, if we could use evil and wrongdoing here as, as perhaps uh, the reasons why someone might be sent into an area that, that maybe looks like hell. This just doesn't happen according to my clients. They are taken in fact to an area of isolation where they are, are given uh, orientation sessions in terms of what it is that they did and why they did it. There's some energy reshaping going on. Um, I explain in the book uh, journey of souls about this process. 
And uh, I just would like to say that these people, generally, who have committed evil, will probably, of their own volition, come back as victims in their next lives. They will volunteer for those assignments. So, no, the spirit world is, is not a place of terror and fear. Let me describe to you um, where I think some people get an idea of a tribunal. And this might be filtering down through their subconscious mind. We do go before a council of what I call elders, wise beings. They've been called the old ones, the sacred ones. There's lots of different names. These are very advanced beings who review the life just lived. Our guides do this. Our guides do this when we first cross over. They talk to us in, in the privacy of a very quiet setting. And so we can kind of unwind and get re-energized. And then we usually go into our home, if you will, our place in the spirit world where we belong. And we can talk about that in a few minutes. But what I'd like to tell you now is the tribunal concept that I, that I hear a lot about. People worried that they might be hauled to work in front of demonic judges and, and made to account for all their sins. These wise beings are our more advanced teachers. They rank, if you will, even above our guides in terms of knowledge, understanding, and experience. What generally I find happens is that our guides accompany us to a very quiet, serene area where these beings will talk to us. Now, I'd like to point out that I have had clients who have had only three of, of these elders in front of them and some as many as 10 or 12. It really depends on the individual, what spirit group they're located in, in terms of how advanced they are and so forth. These beings will question them in a very gentle way about how you, as the person who has just died, conducted your last life, and how you feel about how well you did, or where you had failings, and where there were shortcomings, and they would also like to talk to you about your successes. So it's a very gentle process, and it's one that everyone experiences between lives after every life. And sometimes people will go before them again before their next life in order to review the, the life to come. But essentially, what they are are very wise, understanding beings who will really review with us where we made our mistakes and how we can do better in our next life. This idea of very old souls and very young souls can be confusing. Um, and let me explain why. You might be a, an old soul in the sense that you've been around since the Stone Age, but you might not have learned your lessons very well or very quickly. So you might be uh, maybe uh, going from a beginner to an intermediate as opposed to a more advanced soul simply because you need more time and more lives to do the work that you need to do. I've had other people who have had souls that have progressed very rapidly. I had one lady who in 4,000 years of incarnations on earth, which is not a long time, moved from the beginner level up to almost intermediate, which is very, very fast. So the reason that I can tell this is by the auras they project in the spirit world, and these usually these colors have really no relation to the auras that people who have that ability on earth can see around us. Um, and from the colors of their energy, I can determine the advancement of the soul. This took a long, long time uh, to discover this and all the other things that we're talking about today. I had to piece together this puzzle. It did not all come to me in a rush with that lady I spoke about earlier who was my first case in Life Between Lives. I had to work very hard because people don't volunteer information in order to get the information that I have written about. It took many, many years. And um, I'd just like to say, too, that I tried to keep my work unbiased. And when I talk to you about people like guides and the council and so forth, I ask people, what do you see? Not, do you see so-and-so? So that regardless of how many cases have gone before the client I'm working with now, the material seems fresh to them. I ask open-ended questions so that they will come to me with the answers that they're going to frame in their own minds. And one of them is, as I said, that's a very important one, is what we've just talked about, is, is their counsel, because they really do want to talk to me about these beings and what they mean to them.
People can get misconceptions from ghosts, and uh, it's my feeling that there are beings who have not left the astral plane yet because they're not ready to, they're very dissatisfied with things, maybe they were murdered, they want to find vengeance and so forth. They're not forced into the spirit world. Uh, usually they're taken by the hand when they're ready and taken into the spirit world. I might also say that there's another element of this that's kind of unique to my own work in terms of ghosts. I believe in the duality of souls. Souls have the ability to live parallel lives, to divide their energy. A part of their energy always stays behind in the spirit world. So you could have a ghost with an energy particle who is still on earth but have the same um, holographic image, if, if you will, of that soul's ego in the spirit world at the same time. So we never stop learning and we never actually are totally disconnected from the spirit world. Soul groups are one of the most interesting aspects of my work. The reason for this is that people who I take into their soul group are able to tell me their level of advancement based on how the others are doing in their group as well as themselves. This gives me a much broader perspective as to where this individual is in terms of development. There are, in every soul group, a variety of personalities. You have courageous souls, you have meek souls, you have passive souls, you have a, a souls who are um, very unselfish, those that are a bit more self-centered. Um, you have souls that are quiet and contemplative and those that are jokesters. So from that information, I'm able to determine psychologically a lot about the type of group that my client comes from and what I might be able to do to help them in terms of their life lessons and, and, and purpose. But it's fascinating too from another standpoint because we don't all progress in the same, at the same speed, in the same way, in the same areas. I like to point out that I had one man that took him between four and five thousand years to conquer jealousy. He is not a jealous person in this life. He is intolerant as hell, and that's what he's working on now, but he's not jealous. And so that was his particular uh, difficult hurdle to get over. And yet there are people in his soul group that were always very tolerant, and they have tried to help him between lives. So this is what I mean about rates of progression. And yet I find that the whole soul group pretty generally belongs in a certain niche as far as development and they're all going to kind of move forward together. Some a little faster than others, others will be a little slower, but essentially they're all at about the same level. Essentially in the beginning of our many, many existences, it's about learning lessons. It's about improving, understanding where we are in terms of our development and where we need to go. And the reason that that's such an important question is that many, many people that I work with incarnate on other worlds and are in other dimensions besides Earth. Earth has a particular difficulty in that we have amnesia. Our, our human minds set up an amnesiac block when we come into this world so that we in fact don't have any knowledge that we can recall readily about the spirit world or our spirit guides. Interestingly enough, it's not so true with young, young children. You see a little boy or girl playing in a sandbox, one years old, two years old, and they're having these imaginary playmates, which may not be so imaginary. But by the time they're in the first grade in school, we've pretty much knocked all that out of them. And so, you know, they're that amnesiac block is pretty much set and so they don't remember themselves as spirits and they don't remember their friends in the spirit world as spirits. But what's interesting is that it is a planet Earth is of self-discovery. The idea is that by not knowing the answers to the test questions before you come in, you solve these problems yourself in your own way, in your own time, and in your own environment, and in your own body. Not to say that we don't have genetic problems. There are those who select bodies who do have problems with aggressive behavior. Maybe they have um, a chemical imbalance that causes other behavioral problems that they need to overcome in order to achieve the lessons for which they came through to accomplish on earth. And I'd like to point out that it's by design. Everyone in every body has selected that body. They knew in advance what the body was going to be like to a certain extent. 
and they chose that body with the help of their guides in order to achieve certain lessons. But these same folks can also incarnate on other planets where there is no amnesia. They can be flying creatures. They could be undersea creatures who are very intelligent. They could be interdimensional shadows. They can be flames. They can be water or gas-like creatures. There are all different ways in which we can progress and learn and understand about who we really are and, uh, and the power of our energy. Earth is only one school. For me, it's difficult to say the word God because, to be quite frank with you, I came into this as an atheist. I did not believe in God. I did not believe that there was anything after life but ultimate oblivion. And my clients kind of brought me to this kicking and screaming, brought me to the party. And it was only uh, after years of work with them and the consistency of the reports and knowing what I do about hypnosis and doing the work and research myself that has finally brought me to the point today where I can say that I believe in a power greater than myself, a source for all life and all intelligence. So the concept of all this incarnation is to arrive at that state of perfection where we can rejoin, if you will, that source from whence we came. This is one of the most jovial parts, if I could call it that, of my work. Um, some people think that I, I spend a little too much time with this and make too light of it. I believe that it's important that everybody know that the spirit world is a place of humor and fun. It is not all business. It is not all the kinds of things I describe in some of my chapters about energy work, creation work, learning to cope with our lessons in classroom type situations. There's a lot of that. But we also have R&R, rest and recreation. And um, I've had many clients tell me about playing games. Uh, some of the games I hear are like Red Rover, where sides will line up opposite each other and come crashing together as balls of energy uh, in order to unite and blend their intelligent energy. And it's kind of like playing bumper cars. Others will talk about a dodgeball game, where they will throw bolts of energy at each other, or playing tag, these kinds of things. Um, and there's a lot more esoteric type games where they can go to other worlds where there is no human life, for example, and, and, and frolic, if you will, on that world as spirits who are not there to learn lessons but to simply have fun with each other. And they play. So once in a while when I give a speech about the fact that there is a lot of humor and play in the spirit world, people, some people get a little upset because they think it all should be very, very serious. And uh, I find that that's just not true. What is interesting about talking to people who have incarnated on other worlds is that there is a similarity here. <clears throat> now, it may be that those people who come to Earth also like to go to certain other worlds because what it is that appeals to them about Earth may also be appealing in terms of another kind of environment that's rather similar. For instance, when I'm talking to large audiences, I ask in the audience how many people in this audience have had dreams where they could fly. Usually 75% of them will raise their hand. Then I will say, how many of you have had dreams where you can swim underwater and breathe and that you're in a very intelligent life form? About half will do that. Then I really narrow the field down. I will ask how many have been giants in their dreams where everything else is smaller than they are only a few hands, and then I might ask how many have been really tiny, tiny beings where everything else is larger than you are, and just one or two out of a group of 100 or 200 people. And what this indicates is, and our dreams do tell us an awful lot about our former experiences, is that many people who incarnate on Earth also incarnating on, uh, incarnate on flying and water worlds. And so I've had a number of clients that have talked to me about being flying creatures, highly intelligent flying creatures, on other worlds and what those worlds were like, and, and the same for water and how they can swim deep uh, into an ocean kind of atmosphere and how there's cities under the ocean. And, and they look like to, not whales or dolphins so much, although there's some of that, but creatures that are so strange that we see them only in mythology. 
which by the way is another interesting area for me because I think a lot of our mythology may well come from these early memories. So um, I must tell you that, that there are clients who have had no other incarnating experiences except on Earth, but also many that have had off-world experiences as well. When we dream, generally, uh, my, my way of describing dreams is generally in three categories. We can cleanse our minds at the end of every day. It's kind of a cleaning house where we vent a lot of the things that have gone on. And a lot of it is kind of like we're everything short-circuited up there. We've all had dreams which seem like just utter nonsense. If, if we wake up in the morning and wonder what they were all about, or if we wake up in the middle of the night and they've just happened and we don't make any sense of them. We also have those dreams which are problem-solving dreams. We go to bed with a specific problem and somehow in the morning we wake up and, and, and our answer is beginning to formulate. So that's a very cortexual type of dream where we're really analyzing a problem and uh, it's our sleep state is helping us resolve that. Then we have what I call spiritual dreams. The dreams uh, that I've just described in terms of flying dreams or, or water dreams were in fact we are creatures that we don't understand in a conscious state, but we're reliving earlier experiences. Um, I might also mention that the problem solving and the spiritual dreams can overlap. We may receive help from a guide in the middle of the night to some major problem that we just can't seem to solve during the day and our minds are not open to receiving information from our guides. Maybe we're not people who meditate. So the only way they really have of reaching us is when we're in a subconscious state at night. And so dreams can take many different forms. Future lives is um, an area that I do get into occasionally. Some of my colleagues uh, enjoy working a lot with progression. There's, that's the difference. It's progression instead of regression. Um, and I've heard some interesting, I mean, I've had people who have been on starships because they're, they're seeing into the future. Um, a lot of times, though, I don't like working in the future, even when a client is able to talk to me a little about it, because of the fact that I think from a karmic lesson standpoint, it's better that they not know what's coming up. I feel, again, a lot of importance really comes by our discovering um, and problem solving when the, when the issue is right in front of us. So I'm a little hesitant to spend too much time with that, although I've had many clients who've talked to me, for instance, about the 21st, 22nd century, how overcrowded the next century is going to be on Earth and how there's going to be a lot of air pollution and how it's not going to be real is easy living around here. Um, in fact, it's made my wife and I come to the conclusion, I think we'll wait a century before we reincarnate together again. But I must tell you, too, that uh, th the fact that of time often comes into this. People who ask me questions about whether it's possible to see into the future are suddenly confronted by this business of time, the past, present, and future all being capsulized into one action. And this is confusing for them. It doesn't bother them so much when we talk about past lives and our current life. But when we get into the future, they begin to see that, in fact, all time is, there's not an absolute to time. It's not a chronology like it is on Earth. But in fact, when we are in the spirit world, we're able to see into the future as well as the past. If we were not able to do this, we would not be able to select our bodies and to know a little bit about what's going to happen to us so that we, in fact, can make the determination that this body is going to be right for us. So. As of necessity, people have to come to this philosophic concept that in fact past, present, and future is all relative. There's been a lot of work done in recent years by people who are very scientifically oriented on this. A whole new field of quantum mechanics where they believe that everything is electromagnetic light, energy, uh, and that time is essentially motion and not chronology has come into play where people have had, I think, a greater understanding is quite possible that uh, there is no real relevance to past, present, and future as far as chronology on Earth. It's difficult for us to accept this because we see the sun come up in the morning, go down at night, there's night and day, we age, 
We see everything changing around us. So for us, it's chronology. Time is very important as an absolute, but it's not true in the spirit world. When they decide, and their guides are also involved in this decision, that it's time to come forward and be reincarnated again, um, they go to a place where they can study the bodies that they're going to be given as choices. Now, I find this varies between clients. Some clients are given two or three choices. Other clients are given basically one choice. But I have almost never found a client who has said, I don't like that choice. Their guides and masters know too much about them, too much about what needs to be done to make mistakes in this area. So I find most people are very joyful when they see the bodies that they're going to inhabit in their next life. They look almost as if they go into a television studio or a movie theater and see in stop action certain aspects of the life to come to see whether their soul will fit into the personality of the body that they're going to inhabit and see how that will work in terms of their coming forward. Now, I'd like to say that it's an extremely important part of my work to understand how the soul mind of, of my client is interfacing with their earthly mind in the ego of the body, the brain in which they're now incarnating as a person in this particular life. Because, as I mentioned before, we have different soul egos that combine with different bodies. And it's true that in the womb, when we're analyzing what this mind is like and how we might combine with it, there is a duality. Once we are born, that fusion has taken place. It is not as if the soul is an alien form. That baby recognizes this intelligent life and welcomes it. After all, if we were to take the soul out of, say, a human body, we would probably have raw emotions, there would be a survival instinct, we'd have aggression, we'd have passivity, um, all those things which are influential to a soul. But emotions are very peculiar to a body. A soul has to learn how to cope with that. So the soul brings to the, to the body intuition, imagination, a concept of morality, these sorts of things. So this is very important when a soul is looking at that new body and deciding whether this body is going to really be right for them. So what happens with, after this viewing period is over, um, souls go back and say goodbye to their soul mates and their soul groups and their guides and then they are brought forward into that new body in the womb of their mothers. My clients describe death as something that is very, very beautiful for them. The trauma that has just gone before is pretty much wiped out at the moment of death. They rise out of their bodies, they realize that they're an immortal being. Oh my God, I'm not dead, is a statement I hear quite often. And they look back at their bodies and of course all of their memories of all of who they are as souls and all their past lives come crashing in and they realize that this life they have just lived is transitory. Not that they can't feel sadness for the husband and wife who is at their bedside, for example, or a child. But souls don't feel sadness the same way human beings do because they're immortal beings. They understand that they will soon be joined by these folks they've left behind. And I can tell you this, that most people feel two things. They feel freedom and they feel joy at the moment of death. The disturbed souls uh, are those that um, may have been murdered, for example, or may have lived very, very traumatic lives. They're very unhappy. The soul, if you will, has been contaminated by the human body through all sorts of genetic you know, influences and environmental influences that has caused a very difficult life. Maybe also it's a young soul that has had a hard time coping with the particular difficulties of that mind where a more advanced soul could get through it. There's all sorts of reasons for souls being disturbed in their bodies and that's, that's one of the primary ones.
I find the different levels of souls are generally on three different levels, although I can keep this simple and just say beginner and advanced. In my book, I describe them as beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and there are a couple of grades in between that, but that is a general category. Um, I think that the thing that differentiates the beginner from the intermediate is essentially by the time you reach intermediate level, you're beginning your teacher training. Uh, you're given more responsibility. You've had a lot of lives that have been very difficult, and you've been very successful in your life in handling them. One of the primary things that our guides and teachers look at is how we have treated others in our life. What have we done for others as opposed to ourselves? And if we find people who are really quite unselfish and giving people, we know that probably they're moving into the intermediate level. And from the intermediate level to the advanced level is the difference between a soul being kind of at the beginning stage of teaching to one that is a more advanced teacher. And those souls that are more advanced are into, into work that is very, very demanding. Many of them will have a number of people with whom they are teaching who are on Earth and on other planets. And it is also their responsibility in the spirit world to, if you will, run spirit groups as teachers and to conduct lessons and to work with individual souls on their own problems. So there's quite a difference between a beginner and an advanced soul. Soulmates can be confusing to people. Of course, um, in the spirit world, I find, and I think I've explained this, that uh, in a soul group, we have many soulmates. Our soul groups may be made up of four or five different people or 25 or 30, uh, depending on how quickly we're moving through into the more advanced stages. It could be argued that if your husband or wife is your soulmate, but it could also be argued that your best friend in high school is your soulmate or your business partner or whatever. And it may well be true that they are all soulmates and all come from your spirit group. For me, the most intense soulmate relationship is that being with whom we like to reincarnate in terms of a spouse, someone with whom we've been mated in many, many lives, and we often have changed genders. We've been in the male in one life and then the female in another. So this is another measure of the advancement of the soul because I find too that if souls incarnate mostly as males or mostly as females, they haven't yet reached that intermediate level where they can interchange with ease. So um, soulmates are a very, very important aspect of our lives and sometimes we, have, we learn our greatest lessons with our soulmates. Well, orientation is that aspect of going into the spirit world where you review your last life. You review what it is that you did right and what you did wrong. Transition is when you move into the spirit world to your place where you live with your other souls uh, who are your group. And there may be other groups that you can see around you. And finally, the last uh, area is when you move forward. Uh, that is the time of rebirth and, and embarkation, if you will when the time that you have spent between lives now is completed and you're ready to tackle the next life and the next body and go forward with the next lesson that will give you basically purpose in your life.